a little bit, particularly with Derek's presentation. So until, so seeing nobody rushing for the microphone, I'd like to raise a, a functional question. I think it ties together, hopefully it ties together at least some of the presentations that were given here. Um, you know, we, we all want to go to these planetary surfaces. And you know, we've got the mic bot that we'll throw around the room here. Um, with the issues that we see in the field, you know, when we go back to the moon, we want to understand the ages of surfaces. Because we have a wonderful regolith, you know, we want to go and, and surface uh, get a surface sample from SPA to determine its age. But on the Earth, you don't have the wonderful mixing regolith that sort of uh, simplifies some of the issues on the moon. And particularly, Derek, with, with what occurred here with your issues of, of determining the ages of these flows, and um, Scott mentioned it, finding the right sample on the Earth. And, and how do we take the lessons that we learn from these terrestrial field campaigns and apply them to the moon? Is that possible, or is it apples and oranges and kumquats and race cars? So um, I see deep furrowed brows coming along here. But what do you think of the applicability of what you guys are doing to some of the future explorations, and especially informing where we go? For, 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 for the work I described, the regolith kills you. You need the lava flow. You need a fresh lava. So you'd rely on, on the sort of thing that Jim's been talking about to identify you know, the appropriate sample. But there are, there's a ton of other information you can get out of TL um, concerning the behavior of the regolith. And in particular, because during the regolith process, you are destroying feldspathic materials, then you can see a, a reduction in the induced TL by a, an order of magnitude or more as a result of the of regolith working. So you lose out on the dating, but you pick up on some other stuff with, with, with my take. Brent, pass that. No, I think you throw it. Oh. <laughs> um, I think regarding a lot of us, what we've talked about for, uh, for exploration, it's kind of not also where we want to go, but what we want to do and how we're going to do it when we get there. And learning the strengths and weaknesses of the different types of uh, instrumentation, um, the workflow processes, how much can be done on site, how much has to be human in the loop uh, to do that. And I think a lot of what, you know, again, myself and Brian have, you know, really talked about was, you know, not just about where we want to go, but, and, you know, there's obviously a few cool sites like Pyro Classics or pits or tubes that, you know, we could go do some of our studies at, but sort of what are these new instrumentations that kind of have flown, may not have flown yet, and are, how can we use new instrumentation to, to explore these, these sites. So uh, just speaking for the two talks I gave today, so Lauren Joswiak would say that uh, places like floor fractured craters are incredible laboratories for studying maybe shallow igneous differentiation and volatile ex solution. So you, you know, in the pyroclastic deposits, it's sort of the crime has already been committed, it's all dispersed, et cetera. But in the floor fractured craters, you know, you'd want to look using ground penetrating radar and these other things for how under dense the subsurface is, and then petrologically you'd be able to sample um, not only material thrown out but the pyroclastics and and look for variations across the the whole uh, floor fractured crater. The other thing I would say that I think following up on the question Dave Kring asked, which is you know what are the big unknowns? I think there are so many big unknowns about volcanism on the moon that all these te techniques taken together are necessary. So we don't actually know when volcanism started and we don't actually know when it finished. Are the irregular Mari patches at uh, just a few tens of millions of years actually erupting at that time? That's a huge, huge question to try to answer. Uh, what's going on with the frequency distribution in between? You know, what, why is it shaped like it is? Is it just general evolution of the lithosphere? Uh, in, increasing stresses uh, and cooling uh, affect the generation and ascent and eruption magma. We don't really know that. What's the role of impact basins? We know that the, the lavas end up in the basins, but is that because there's some correlation between impacting and, you know, secondary convection? Uh, you know, these are all the really dozens and dozens of fundamental questions that this complex uh, array of instruments and capabilities uh, that we need to, to, to get at them. So, thanks, Jim. Yeah. I want to echo everything Brent said, but underscore one part of that is, you know, one thing we had in common in our analog field studies is that we're using off-the-shelf technology that's, that's uh, not uh, 
made specifically for planetary applications. So I think really the next step is a, a collaboration needs to happen with the engineering community to, to modify these things, to see what works, what needs to change, miniaturize when necessary, automate where necessary, et cetera, put them on rovers, other platforms. But I think um, you know we need to advance the TRL level of these things, basically, and, and get them dialed in. Yeah, so I think one of the, the things that I, I'm sort of on the fringes of, oh, Mindy, do you want to try that? Thanks. Uh, yeah, just uh, expanding on what Brian was saying, uh, I think it's really important to, you know, get in touch with the engineering community and try to really assess the instruments. Uh, instruments are great and all of that, they you know, provide information, but uh, we got to be able to understand and know how to use them. So maybe they can be used the best by humans or by robots or machines. Uh, the best way of finding that out is through by these uh, analog studies, and uh, that's a really important part of the work. <laughs> this is like past the potato. Uh, it, it, it says very explicitly on the bottom, do, do not, not throw at heads. Oh. Do not <laughs> throw at heads? Does it really? Oh, no, not heads. Oh. You can throw it. Okay. Um, <laughs> heads, plural. Okay, heads, okay. So, but, I think one of the things that I've really enjoyed seeing here at, at the survey forums over the last several years is this, how the, the field studies are, are not only advancing planetary science, but also like earth science, you know, this real important stuff that we're asking questions that haven't been asked before. I'd like to maybe get a sense of, you know, how, what could be done to better integrate the results that you're getting into mission planning, you know, or, or, or future options, you know, we all have ideas of where we want to go and, and, and what we want to do on the surface, but when the rubber meets the road, getting those instruments to TRL levels that are acceptable, that's a challenge. Um, are there things that could be done in the near future to facilitate that? Well, I, I think the kind of astronaut training we were talking about is obviously essential, but you know, I was thinking about what Derek was pointing out in that anomalous data point, and you know, the question was asked, uh, could it have been a poor sampling? Um, uh, for sampling, that is, you didn't exactly know where the sample was. You know, it's really, this brings up the criticality of documentation of sample location, et cetera. So that's something we don't, you know, we do deal with, but it's a really critical thing. So so just taking that kind of approach and, you know, uh, working with the new astronauts and beyond and just sampling strategy and documentation, it sounds boring, but it is completely essential. So that's just another piece of it. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a very good point. I was able to do the Hawaii study because the people who, who did the dating left such an amazingly good record of, 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 of how they, of, of where they took the samples. And, and so we were able to go straight to the spot. And not, not just a, 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 you know, a GPS coordinate, but a description, a, a, a turn in the road. A, 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 the post office is seven miles down the road. You know, this is really, ex really excellent. Are there any questions from the huddled masses? Yes. <laughs> from the hungry masses. Hungry masses. <laughs> the thirsty. The hungry. Scattered masses. That's right. <laughs> you you know, you're, you're raising the, the issue of, of sampling, and I was thinking uh, about the environment of a lava tube. Sometimes these are pressurized over several times, so. You know, you're laying down a surface, so you may be eroding it. If you go in, sometimes you'll see the lines where lava has flowed. So there's a, but you know, ne ne don't necessarily know what sequence that might be. And so, I mean, I, I think, you know, it'd be interesting to, to try and get samples from, you know, by penetrating it and seeing what were the oldest flows and, can, you know, can we develop some sort of chronology? Uh, and that might give us some time depth, you know, for, for how, how long it took for various reservoirs to maybe go through that vent system. Uh, you know, I think there's, you know, it's a hard problem, I think, but I think there's some interesting uh, issues that arise. I think that's a really good point. And I would just say, you know, that was one of the things I was so excited about look, looking at these presentations because that's a critical question that we have in the generation S and an eruption. You know, we have theory that suggests that uh, you overpressurize and, you know, there's essentially a monotonic decay, if you will, of uh, overpressurization as a function of eruption, that should be mapped out in these lava tubes, okay? And so, uh, on the moon and elsewhere. So, actually, th there's a hell of a lot of information that's in those LIDAR uh, reconstructions, which talk about the sequence, and then you can go in and look in detail and sample, uh, but that's, that would be critical for the moon. That would be really critical uh, to get that information to test the theory. 
Uh, I'm fascinated with overpressurization these days. And I think that overpressurization is responsible for so many, so many things. Uh, and as we're finding out, it seems like uh, 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 what's also fascinating to me is if perhaps the fact or hypothesis that uh, structural features on the moon are pretty much all related to some sort of magmatic process. Uh, we don't have plate tectonics, obviously, and so there might be some crustal relaxation and so forth, secondary. But I think the primary cause of all these uh, structural features on the moon could ultimately be, as you were pointing out, Jim, could be related to um, uh, some sort of magmatism and overpressurization. It's, it's, a, it's a really interesting point. And uh, this afternoon, in a talk by Weiss and Head, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll emphasize what we're trying to do to distinguish between those two. Because it's, it's not, you know, they, they call it, could all be tectonic, they could all be volcanic. Certainly it's some mix. How do you tell which is which? And it's really an important question. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, no, I think what is the really interesting question, as Jim was saying yesterday, this is a heavily impacted body, you know, by and large. And it's the relationship between impact and volcanism that intrigues me. Yeah, I mean, and that, well, and it's that impact. I'm thinking about sampling strategy. You have this well-mixed regolith that, that takes away maybe that, that sampling mistake. It's you're given this wonderful natural laboratory that creates a mixture that you sample where you can go to a single location and learn about an entire region. In fact, entire moon, Jim talked about the Apollo 11 samples. It's just that turning point. One scoop of regolith turns history of the solar system on its end. One set of samples from, a, a, from, a, from one location can tell you a lot. You lose that Scott Hughes problem of field <laughs> issues. OK, I, I just have to address that. I, I limited memory, uh, but I do recall, we were out there, Derek. Um, we were trying desperately to make sure that we are located properly. And of course, GPS, no problem. We got that. But there is also the possibility that, and especially on the volcanic terrain, you could be just a few meters away from a contact with a different unit. And so I, I sort of suspected that on a couple of occasions we might have missed. And that was the only reason I brought that up, because uh, uh, it, 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 I worry about these things. As, and, and the point that Jim made a minute ago, we've got to label, locate, identify, and document, document, document every little thing we pick up. That's exactly right. And there was one, there's one instance I recall in the in the Idaho, no, 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 the Hawaii case, where there was some ambiguity in one of the locations, and I've got that written up in great detail in my notes. But what yeah. what was really frustrating was that was not point thirty seven. <laughs> Just a quick uh, alibi of this. So so this is a really important <coughs> problem for us in Antarctica because the GPS. I mean, you just don't have as much positioning. Uh, and so you're, you're, it's not as accurate. So proper documentation is a mantra. You know, you really have to nail it down, and you know, not just notes, but photographs, documented photographs, and the whole nine yards. And then you know, because you can, we we can easily reconstruct it once we have that. And a GPS is only like, oh yeah, we were in this valley, you know, something yeah. like that. You were on the surface of the earth somewhere in the southern hemisphere. Uh, Jake, I'll let you uh, close out this discussion session. I was just going to say, Jake Bleacher, Goddard Space Flight Center, I was going to say that the stuff that Brent's doing with the LIDAR, if you can envision that in an architecture where that LIDAR is traveling with you, you basically build that frame of reference from wherever you start. Presumably, you know where you started from. You build that frame of reference, and you mark those points along the way in the data set that you're producing. And true, you don't know it precisely from a GPS standpoint, but I think that the thinking about the way these instruments would be used together in an integrated fashion really nails down and helps with that uh, that documentation and just That's situational true. awareness to where you're at. Yeah, we, we, if, if, if somebody else had been making the decisions, there might have been one of these on the 2020 rover from Mars. But it was <laughs> only a couple billion dollars. Uh, well, you know, the Navy submarines use an, an inertial guidance system. Mm -hmm. So even if you don't have GPS, you know, they have that precision, you know, where you start a track and you can keep very close track of, of where you are. And, and that might be something that could be applied to uh, the navigation and documentation of moving through a three-dimensional uh, volume like a, a lava tube system. All right. I want to thank our speakers for, for allowing us to, 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 to take some time for discussion. Thank you all for participating. Let's have lunch.
and come back at, I believe, 1 p.m. for the beginning of the uh, afternoon sessions. So thank you all, and uh, let's enjoy some lunch. <laughs>